Funding for Inner Compass is provided by Calvin College. The life that's unfolding. The world that awaits. Gifts that are yours to explore. And God's to use. It's all happening here at Calvin. Welcome to Inner Compass. I'm Shirley Hoekstra. Is a woman tough enough to be president? Can she lead a country into war? Can she stand up against terrorists? Can she do it all in a pink suit? And does that really matter what she wears? Today on Inner Compass, we're going to talk about women in politics. Join us. From the campus of Calvin College, this is Inner Compass, exploring how people use faith and ethics to guide them through critical issues of today. My guest today is Eleanor Clift, contributing editor and columnist for Newsweek magazine. She writes on the Washington power structure and the influence of women in politics and other issues. Today we're discussing her book, Madam President, Women Blazing the Leadership Trail. Welcome, Eleanor. Glad to be with you. What a timely topic, of course. Uh, the political scene is changing, and yet we shouldn't vote for a woman just because it's her turn. What are some of the reasons to vote for a woman, if there is a gender reason? Well, first of all, uh, this book was published in 2000 with the anticipation that one or both of the major parties would put a woman on the ticket in the number two spot. Okay. It had been already by then 16 years since Geraldine Ferraro made history by being the first woman to uh, be on a major party right. uh, ticket. And a lot of people thought it was time. Well, it didn't happen in 2000. No. And I don't think that uh, my late husband and I, when we wrote this book, really thought that uh, a serious woman candidate would be positioned uh, to run for president as opposed to being sort of anointed in the number uh, two spot. So I think a lot has changed just from uh, eight years since, since 2000. And I think the reasons to elect a woman are she's meritorious. Right. And I think if you look uh, at the current field, uh, Hillary Clinton certainly has a resume that stands up uh, very well. And the irony is that she's uh, had to prove that she's likable enough right. uh, as opposed to uh, being credible enough. And one of the hurdles that we found for women is that uh, the voters don't think they're tough enough to be a chief executive. You know, how are they going to stand up to foreign leaders? And, uh, How are they going to get military call? That's right. And Hillary Clinton's toughness has never come into question. So she's really uh, uh, one of those exceptions that I think proves all the rules. They say that men are decisive, objective, logical, independent, ambitious. Women are intuitive, sensitive, nurturing, and accommodating. It's my hope that those stereotypes are done. Am I? overly optimistic. Um, well, I don't know that they're done because, uh, again, when um, putting all this through the prism of Hillary Clinton because she's such a dominant figure right. today, when um, she, you know, tears up, uh, then people wonder, is it is it calculated? Now, right. if a man had teared up, um, would we have wondered whether it was calculated or would we think he was Sensitive. showing compassion or would we think he was weak? And I think it's almost different for everybody. If Barack Obama teared up, I don't think that would help him because he is seen as sort of a soft healer. And he How about couldn't Giuliani? afford to do it. Giuliani, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> <laughs> he can tear up a little right, bit. Right, but, right. But um, we do tell the story in the book. Pat Schroeder, who ran uh, briefly for president in 1988, uh, when she realized she couldn't uh, raise enough money, she was running a campaign basically on her credit card, um, and she bowed out, and she was surrounded by the people who had supported her, and she started to cry, and uh, she was ridiculed. And so she ever since has kept what she calls a crying folder, documenting all the times that male politicians cry, and they are lauded. Uh, uh, for doing so. so. And I think for the most part that's true, but there are exceptions. I think Barack Obama would be, would be one of them. So it's really not about gender. It's about the whole package. If you're male and seen as a slightly softer, then you better not cry. If you're female and you're too tough, maybe a tear or two works for you. Is it safe mm -hmm. to say that we are taking people um, personally and not as a stereotype anymore? Yes. Uh, actually, um, 
before the results of the New Hampshire primary were in, I talked with uh, Deborah Tannen, who is quite a, a noted linguistics yes, professor. Yes, I've read many of her books. Are yes, excellent. she wrote um, You Just Don't Understand. She right. studies male, female uh, dialogue. And, um, you know, she was pointing out that, uh, that, that Hillary Clinton is uh, seen as tough, but if uh, she's seen as too tough, then people don't like her. And finding that narrow range in there is, is really difficult, especially when we don't have role models in our culture. I mean, we forget with all the uh, excitement about the campaign trail and uh, that she really is the first she is a woman to be seriously considered as a potential uh, president. And, right, you know, because she, Geraldine Ferraro, vice presidential candidate, never really got the credibility that she needed to uh, take that ticket, in, in my estimation. Right. And since then, we've had uh, Dole, Elizabeth Dole, who didn't really stay long term. Right. We've got Margaret Thatcher, but everybody says, well, you know, the Iron Lady. Right, so right. she was in some ways, do you think, seen well, as she, an anomaly? Uh, oh, no, she, she helped women a lot because, okay. um, again, the question is toughness. Can a woman be tough enough? And all you have to do is cite Margaret Thatcher. I mean, Golda Meir also yes. helps. Yes, <laughs> she know, was tough. In Israel. Yes. And, um, but uh, Margaret Thatcher uh, didn't appoint women to her cabinet. Uh, she didn't do any of what we think of as gender specific policies, like, you know, increasing social welfare. She right. did just the opposite. Right. But again, by projecting toughness, I think she let everybody know that this can be done. And in her book, she also wrote that women of a certain age should start lightening their hair. And <laughs> Hillary Clinton openly says that she has uh, followed that advice. <laughs> well, okay, so let's talk about that double standard. We hope mm -hmm. the stereotypes are a little bit lessened, but the double standard. Okay, you've got mm -hmm. a double standard on age, looks, right. divorce, et cetera. Is that still in play? Uh, the double standard on age, I think Hillary Clinton at age 60 is probably just about the right age. Um, too much older, uh, I don't think you could see a woman who is the same age as John McCain. Right, 71. Uh, 71. Mm -hmm. And uh, John McCain is going to get a lot of questions about his age. Yeah. He's two years older than Ronald Reagan was. at. at the, at a comparable time in his political life. Right. And, it's a uh, high energy job. Right, it's a high energy job. But I, I, first of all, all you have to do is look at John McCain on the campaign. He's high job, energy. And you don't, you don't worry about it. And uh, there also might be some virtues to having a one-term president who really feels True. what Barack Obama calls the fierce urgency of now. <laughs> right, right. Um, but younger, you're not going to get a woman who's uh, uh, Edward's age or even, uh, they're not well, Edward, seasoned enough. No, Edward's age, Edward's is in his early 50s. And you think a woman could be yes, ready in her uh, early 50s? Well, uh, at some point in the future, perhaps. Okay. Now, th that, that is one of the hurdles. I mean, women, uh, for the most part, do not um, adopt a political career at a young enough age. They still wait till their children are older. Um, and a lot of women who would be very qualified uh, in the political arena find that uh, they'd rather be in the business world right. or do other lawyering. There, yeah, there are lots of other opportunities where they can make a lot of money, they can mm -hmm. feel like they're making a difference, That's and right. they don't have to put their family under a microscope. And you also mentioned the marital uh, status. Uh, it was pointed out in uh, the year that Elizabeth Dole ran, uh, Pat Buchanan was also running right. on the Republican side. And uh, Elizabeth Dole, it was it was mentioned that she was childless, right? And Negative. Pat Buchanan doesn't have any uh, children, but right. that didn't seem to figure into his no. resume. No. So yeah, there there there's still plenty of double standards. Oh well, that Giuliani, exist. three times married, married, and right. if a woman were three times married, I don't think she'd even get out of the box. Uh, Not now. I, well, you know, Diane Feinstein. Uh, was three times married. One, she, one she, deceased. Yeah, and, right, exactly. And that was an issue in disqualifying her right. as a running mate for um, Walter Mondale in 1984. Right. He went with Jerry Ferraro, who was long time <laughs> married. And the irony is, of course, Ferraro's husband turns out to be a problem because he doesn't want to release his tax oh, returns no. and he's sort of got some uh, murky business dealings. And, Ferraro says at a press conference, trying to apologize for not making these returns public, she says, you know how these Italian men are. And that created this huge furor. If she can't stand up to her husband, how does she stand up to the, you know, the Soviets? Right, that's right. <laughs> right. And, uh, but let me talk a little yeah. bit about the, the sensitive topic about weight. 
okay? Mm -hmm. uh, weight and women, we know that from the literature, big, big national uh, conversation. Although Huckabee is able to say, I lost 100 pounds, and people right. say, wow, look <laughs> at that, right? right? And no one says it about Richardson, but you say, hey, maybe you should get on the treadmill, right? Because if you're gonna be yeah. healthy enough, fit enough, but, it's, but for women, uh, do you think there's a double standard on that? You know, I almost don't think so because Good. you know, who I'm who came to mind immediately when you started talking mm -hmm. about uh, losing weight was yeah. Oprah, yes. who has recounted her battles with uh, weight, mm -hmm. and very publicly. And uh, everybody loves Oprah. <laughs> well, she and she has made um, it acceptable. It's yes. been a platform for her. Yes. Yes. And, that size doesn't matter. And Bill Richardson jokes about uh, mm -hmm. his inability really to you know curb himself, <laughs> and uh, he's. Quite, quite appealing, right. and I, I always thought that uh, Mike Huckabee, if he could, you know, share all his secrets, that he there's a lot of people who would look to him for that. But to take the appearance thing a step beyond weight, right. I think women do have to find what outfit they're comfortable with on the campaign trail. And I always remember Hillary Clinton after winning her Senate race in 2000, her first Senate race. She thanked her seven black pantsuits. <laughs> right. Yeah, and uh, in some of the interviews that have been done with her on the campaign trail, uh, some of the female anchors want to know, how does she get her hair to look so good every day? And she confided that she has help. She has she help. She has help, and That's she right. said. And she should have help. Yes, and she said, and if you go on the web, you can find pictures of me when I didn't have help. She right. said, because the media always finds those. But that's interesting when you say, and she should have help. Because, you know, a lot of women think, my goodness, having your own personal hairdresser or having your hair done, you know, somehow sets you apart. But she has, um, a, she's a public figure, and exactly. what she wears, or what, what a person wears communicates exactly. something. What do you think um, women are thinking about when they dress, whether it's in the Senate, in the House, or like Hillary, what is she trying to communicate with her dress? I think she's trying to communicate uh, authority, but with a sense of flair. Right. You don't want to look so different that your outfit draws attention. In fact, one of the debates, John Edwards commented on her jacket, which I think was a bright pink, if I remember correctly, and uh, that that actually hurt Edwards that yes. that he singled right. singled that out. But right. Hillary, for the most time, most part. Uh, looks pretty uh, professional. And the one time on the Senate floor where she wore a slightly lower cut I know, shirt, I read about it. It got all, right, you read, read about, about it. it. It got all sorts of, uh, right. of, of attention. And, uh, and that would never, never happen. But right. let, let's talk, it, and it, 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 writing about the, the slight cleavage uh, TV programs that show women in professional roles. Mm -hmm. uh, they are dressed completely inappropriately, and, and when I and my daughter are watching these uh, CSI Miami or Law and Order mm -hmm. or any of these shows where you have professional women in their short skirts, they can't bend over, their shirts are too low, they're always sleeveless. And I say, it just doesn't happen in the real world. You cannot dress like that and be successful in the real world. Now, is that going to change because all um, of these shows are showing I actually us? think it's generational. I think it does happen in the real okay. world. <laughs> <laughs> okay, tell me about that. Um, I do, yeah, I do think that younger women uh, have gotten away from this notion that if you uh, dress provocatively that somehow that denigrates you. I think they, they feel like, you know, <laughs> Use it while you have it. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I've, actually no, I've actually no, noticed that, and um, I think it started with the, the kind of the dress down Friday, which um, then the dress down Fridays are not like what I would consider dressing down. <laughs> you have to go out and buy a special outfit, <laughs> and I, I just think. Uh, there's a lot of latitude now in the business place. It's it very different place. from the dress for success, right. you know, suits that uh, women who first broke into the business world uh, wore, where they were looking like, you know, female versions of men. Right. The Mr. Sisters. That's right. Right. But uh, when it comes to politics, when it comes to being oh. a leader of the free world, I don't think you're going to want to have a bunch of pictures in the photo. Uh, imagery uh, catalog that says, oh, that this is what she looked like. I think, I think people wouldn't take you as seriously. No, I, that I agree with, right. yeah. yeah. I think poli political, political women uh, do, you know, they're going to be talked about enough. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, again, in the book, I think we have a picture of uh, women at a, um, at a press conference, 
and they showed all their footwear and yes. it was all and and the women who were involved wrote in and said well why don't you show a picture of all the men in their footwear you right. know what is what is so special about us all right. wearing you know pumps <laughs> right right yeah. you we talk about uh, that women in your book you say that women actually are women winning in the same mm -hmm. in the same uh, way that men are winning uh, in the races that say for state legislature uh, senate house uh, mm -hmm. but they're not running as much anymore is that still true? You wrote the book in 2000. Do you yeah. think it's still true? Well, there was a, a, a burst of excitement in uh, 92, uh, which was prompted in part by the, the Anita Hill hearings on right. Capitol Hill. Uh, even people who didn't necessarily side with her version of events looked at this all-male uh, judiciary committee grilling her, and they uh, felt like they wanted to get some more females on Capitol Hill and, and 92 was pronounced the year of the woman because yes. more women were elected than in any uh, previous election year. I think since then the numbers have, uh, have, have, have leveled off um, and you know some people have said that if the uh, increases continue at the level they're going which are rather minute you know it'll be a century before uh, parity is achieved on on Capitol Hill. Right. I think women still have to be lured in. Um, this Why? part of it is psychological. Um, they're still not, you know, really plugged into the the lawyer networks where when a, a political opening occurs that somebody sees them as the natural heir. And says, and, why don't you do it? Right, right. yes. Women still want to be asked. <laughs> I know, right. And they still uh, think, well, maybe I don't have enough uh, expertise to do this. And so, you would think this would be changing, uh, but um, but it isn't. And you know, th other things like childcare. Um, right. We still don't have childcare arrangements in this country. That unless you really have enough money, uh, you have to worry about who's going to take care of your children if right. you take on this very demanding career. And well, so, and politics is not a high-pay job. No, uh, that's exactly right. They're so you, you either have to have deep pockets yourself and you're willing to spend them on yourself, right. or you've got to have a network of people who are going to contribute to your candidacy. And right. other than Hillary Clinton, you could probably name on the fingers of one hand the women in public life today who would have access to enough money to gain entrance to a presidential race. Right. I mean, it's hard enough to run uh, for governor, and I think we've now got eight governors out of 50. Right. Uh, so uh, we're still way beyond, way behind in filling the pipeline that uh, leads to the White there House. There is a pipeline issue. Um, you said that that's correct. You know, we have uh, only eight governors. That's less than 18 percent. Seventy-three representatives out of 435, which right. is 17 percent, and then mm -hmm. 16 U.S. senators out of 100, which is 16 percent. So this pipeline is very narrow, which is going to give us a narrower field in the event that we ever want to have a female candidate every year. It doesn't right. sound and seem likely that that would occur. Right, and you don't really want just one female candidate. No, that's it would be the nice problem. if you had right. a couple. Yeah, that, right. <laughs> Although then you get into the issue of how do women uh, you know, play off each other. Right. Now, we have had a number of, of, of races on the congressional level and, and statewide of women against well, each other, are, and yes. I think we're figuring that out. Okay. But on the presidential level, I would, I would shudder to think in some debates of uh, two women going at each other because, you know, the image of the cat fight <laughs> always arises. Right. Right. And Another stereotype. Yes, yes. And so, uh, you know, so we're still in the early stages of, of this, and, you know, if Hillary uh, succeeds, uh, that is going to send uh, a very big signal right. uh, to women throughout the country. We, you mentioned about the financial cost of running, but there are some other costs that keep women from running. And I think we mentioned that there are other options. You know, qualified mm -hmm. women who are strong and, and have leadership qualities can be in business or law or some right. other things. Um, what about the scrutiny that happens? Is there, are there right. other costs involved? Right. You know, as a culture in America, we love to beat up on our politicians. We I do. Mean, they are just, you know, fair game. We pick them apart. It takes right. a lot of courage to be able to withstand that and then to uh, 
put yourself out there and have people vote on you. I mean, it, right. it brings back all the anxiety, anxiety from the class uh, election in fifth right. grade. Right. Right. <laughs> so politicians, I give them credit. That and it's take, long hours. It takes courage, exactly. Uh, we, and, and some of our representatives sleep in their offices. They don't have a glamorous Washington <laughs> life and a glamorous home life because you're keeping both homes, right? Well, they don't. They frown on people sleeping in their offices, but it has been it done. Has been, <laughs> it has been done. But uh, many no. of them do, uh, you know, bunk together. Yes. In, Right, uh, in, right. in condos or, or, or that sort of thing. And, and to that, uh, women do add uh, confidence about conversations in the legislature. I think it, you wrote about the fact that women said, women, the legislators in Congress and the Senate said, we don't want to have votes scheduled over dinner time oh. because we want to get home. Right. Now, men didn't want to raise that issue because they didn't want to look perhaps like they were like uh, they were wusses was and taking <laughs> orders from their wives. And getting exactly. home for dinner with their children, yeah, right? Yeah. But women did. Uh, women did, and they and they complained about it, and tried to bring some more order, orderliness to the Senate schedule right. and to the House schedule. And of course, now we have a female as the Nancy House Pelosi. Speaker, Nancy Pelosi, and um, she has made a uh, tradition of serving food at whatever meetings she she holds. She always says, "I'm I'm an Italian mother." <laughs> okay, so she but can I think say the, yeah, but I think the hours are still pretty bad. Yeah, I bet yeah, they are, and yeah. I bet she's a hard worker now. And Nancy Pelosi is a perfect example, perhaps, of being a fashionable being strong, you know, being competent, and then also bringing what we might call a value added of hospitality, let's have some food, let's right. humanize right. this, right? She's also a perfect example of somebody who didn't enter politics until her kids were okay. in school, All right. and she had five children, and then she, uh, you know, worked as, a, as an organizer right. in an unpaid positions, and then until she finally ran, and right. when she ran, it, it was a seat uh, that was vacated by one of her close friends, by the husband right. of a close friend and they persuaded her to do it oh, and interesting. Uh, so yeah so she she got into politics rather late in life and she actually said it's easier to get elected than to get power in congress as a female right i forget the exact number of men who were in the house when she, uh, number of women who yeah. were in the house when she got there but it was a very small number almost just a handful right. but she had grown up i believe she's the youngest of seven she had all these brothers and um, so, and her father was a uh, former congressman, was mayor of Baltimore. And so, as she puts it, when she uh, got into this boys club, yeah. she wasn't intimidated and she wasn't all that impressed. <laughs> well, <laughs> but it took her, it. you know, she, right. she, she became a household name, not even quite a household name, but when she became speaker. Uh, but um, she was no overnight success. I mean, there was a good, I think, 17 years in the, in the house uh, before she made this extraordinary breakthrough. And even every powerful leader has to have persons who come alongside them and are mentors, and they're going to be of many gen uh, either male or female, aren't they? Right, and, right. and yes, and, and she, she did. She had she had a, a powerful uh, not a kingmaker, John, but, John right. Murtha, right, uh, uh, member of the uh, the, the uh, military committee. Right. Uh, Armed Services Committee on the House side, one of the what Congress calls the old bulls. He'd been there forever, kind of a conservative Democrat, right. and he took her under his wing, and that was a, a, a that it's was major. very meaningful for her. Right. Yes, men often still carry most of the power and have a lot of the networks and the connections. I'm just going to go internationally mm -hmm. a minute with this question, which is uh, Chile's president, yes. uh, Michelle uh, Bachelot. Uh, she did change her cabinet up to be 50% women and 50% men, and, and this was not successful. And then she had to reshuffle her yeah, cabinet. I actually was in Chile uh, a year ago and interviewed Michelle Bachelet, and uh, yes, um, she got a lot of pressure because she disturbed the existing networks of power, and she had to make some compromises. Okay. And I think one or two of the women that she put in power, you know, did not succeed like she wished them to, and they immediately became, uh, you know, scapegoated. Right. Uh, but she has tried very hard to shift politics in this uh, very macho uh, country. Very much. <laughs> yes. So. Yes. And I think she's only she they they she's only allowed to serve a single four-year term. Um, and I think um, that she's had, uh, she's really met a lot of resistance. But I think simply by being there, uh, she right. has altered uh, how they how they look at politics. Yes, that would have to be the case. Mm -hmm. One last uh, example: Jane Swift in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. When you read about uh, her situation, she had these twins while she was in office. She wasn't elected as governor. She came to be governor when the governor was asked to be the ambassador, and then uh, she had some resistance, but. 
a childbearing politician seemed like it didn't work. I mean, when she was child well, while, while she was in office. I think it can work. I think it can work. But I think you have to be sensitive to uh, the, the messages you're sending. And I think where Jane Swift got into trouble was uh, seeming to use state resources to oh. help her care for her children. And there are a lot of uh, women out there who are working two jobs and trying to, you know, put child care together however they can do it. And they resent somebody using what they see as their tax dollars somebody who they think is in a privileged uh, position. Um, there are women in Congress now with uh, young children. In fact, I think one uh, member of Congress recently uh, gave birth. Right. And Blanche Lincoln of um, Arkansas is an interesting example we talk about in the book. Mm -hmm. When she, she, she had been a congressional aide, and then she uh, ran for the seat of the man that she used to work for, right. and she won the seat in Congress. And she's in Congress, and she's married, and she discovers she's pregnant with twins, and she uh, decides not to run again, and she makes all these statements about how she wants to be home to give her children her, their values right. and all of this. Right. And then, you know, like less than two years later, a Senate seat opens up. She wants to run for right. it. And so how does she take back all of those <laughs> comments she right. made? Right. Well, she had advertising with a picture of her husband taking care of the children. So everybody's OK. <laughs> everybody's OK. Right? This is an opportunity. Uh, I'm going to leave. Absolutely. Right. And she won the Senate seat. And I think everybody's doing just fine. <laughs> well, that's excellent. Right. Thank you, Eleanor. Thank you. My guest today has been Eleanor Clift, contributing editor and columnist for Newsweek magazine and author of the book, Madam President, women blazing the leadership trail. I'm Shirley Hoekstra, and thank you for watching Inner Compass. Mm -hmm.